and uh, welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim, and uh, unfortunately our speaker is not showing up tonight. She had confusion that she thought it was the 18th instead of the 8th. So tonight... Good one. I am not exactly sure what exactly happened, but Charlie just spoke with her on the phone, so she's not going to be able to uh, make it in tonight. In November, no. Uh, as I said, the speaker is not showing up. Now we are going to start off with announcements, and then we'll move into a somewhat of a, a, re a refined program. We can still keep the spirit of her. Uh, debate up and if anybody wants to come up here and tell us how they've simplified their life with consumer or cut back in this economy, I think that might not be a big deal with an open mic night, which we haven't had in quite a while. So, you know, between us and with uh, Jeff and a few other people around here and us, some of us who have some good oratorical uh, things going on, we'll decide the format and it's not going to be an all rebuttal mic, but we'll try to do what we have to do. I have a backup plan if uh, people are ready to go, but let's try to keep the theme tonight in the spirit of our speaker and uh, how have we all simplified Thank you. our lives. And now uh, we will have a debate on a simpl uh, simplicity revolution, finding happiness in the new reality between Jeff Schrammack of the College of Complexes and Tim Bolger of the College of Complexes. All right. Jeff's going to take 20 minutes. Let's get this to be good. It's going to be great, Frank. Thank you. 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 I'll go for 20, 25 minutes. We'll wrap it up and go back and forth for a little while. All right. Let's get going. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Now, I, of course, didn't come here tonight prepared to give any long talk about a simplicity revolution. However, I have given a fair amount of thought to aspects of what one might call a simplicity revolution. A, in terms of the proposition that we are in all likelihood going to be confronted with circumstances which will force us into some sort of simplicity revolution. And B, I've given quite a bit of thought into the sort of things that we can do now which will at least in critical respects get us ready to implement a sort of simplicity revolution. First, I suppose I should say some things about why I am betting that we're going to have to do something like this. The write-up on the speaker's plans indicated she was going to refer to the corporatocracy. And uh, I have to say that I, I'll wager that she and I will, would have been in at least rather broad agreement on the power of what she's calling the corporatocracy. And there's, uh, to some extent, in this sort of a situation, you have a chicken and egg phenomenon here. But I just submit to you, in terms of who's causing what, ultimately, my view is that the problems that this country, if not the world, is having, and the reason why this country, if not the world, is in a brutal trajectory, is, in the first instance, that the media was taken over. And the media has been sleeping, particularly for the past 15 or so years. But if you want to go back to the cover-up of the Kennedy assassination, be my guest. It's been a long deterioration. But events in the past 15 years, the consolidation of the media empires has been a catastrophic development. And so over the past dozen, 15 years, some such, in particular, although you can go back at least a few decades if you want, this country has been subject to more or less grotesque malgovernance. At least these guys so far haven't just pushed the button and put us all out of our misery. But short of that, 
it's almost arguable that they have trashed the place as much as they could have done. No, I'll admit that's an exaggeration. But it's bad enough that it's obvious to all but the sadly ignorant or willfully blind that this sucker, as W used to say, this sucker is going down. And the only question is how far and how fast. Well, in light of those rather grim circumstances, uh, it behooves us to at least begin to think of how we might function, say, without the electric grid. And not only how we might function, but how others might function or fail to function by our lights. And of course, that means that they will fail to obey the laws and instead decide that in order to feed their faces, they might want to expropriate what we have. So one of the things we have to think about is the prospects of having to defend ourselves rather than being able to rely on the cops, who may just be hunkering down in their homes. Now, it doesn't have to get that bad in order for us to be able to take all sorts of prudent steps. If you guys, can you everybody, was everybody able to hear me or not? I, I can't quite hear you, but if you turn oh. the mic towards you. Okay. You know, no. Let's go up and down. We hit it. Okay, up yeah, and yeah, yeah, right. Okay, okay. All right. So, there. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah, yeah. All right, so there's things we can do to improve our percentages even if things don't get as bad as I refer to with the cops all hunkering down in their homes. For starters, for a couple bucks or so, you can get yourself a ref's whistle. This one happens to be called an Acme Thunderer, if I remember right. Now, so if some badass is chasing you down the street, it's going to take you a second or so such to grab this thing and blow into it. And at least maybe, there's no guarantees here, but at least maybe give the badass some sort of pause. It's possible at least that somebody might hear your whistle and take a look and might conceivably decide to spring to your aid. If you don't blow in the whistle, there's no chance. If you blow in the whistle, there's some kind of a chance. For 10 bucks or give or take, whatever it is, it might be a pretty damn good investment. Now, there's any number of other things that I have with me at various times under various conditions that pertain to all this and various other big purchases that I have made. Um, you can buy, as an example, um, a roll of Kevlar. Okay. Yeah, Frank's got one of one of the uh, one of the bigger. Uh, the, 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 I've mislaid mine momentarily, but one of the bigger flashlights, which are capable of blinding somebody, and you can even push a button and make it blink. And that's a real pain to be looking the way you do. Uh, yeah, there you go. A blinking flashlight, all right? Now, so if the bad guy's blinded for 30 seconds, those might, those might be some pretty damn precious 30 seconds for you. All right. So, and like I was going to say, yeah, Frank and, this, so Frank and I have been talking off and on about this for months or years, depending on how you want to measure it. Um, so, and you, there, I was going to say, there's something called Kevlar that you can buy on eBay or whatever. And I, I just recently bought... Oh, gee, 30 yards by 16 inches for 400 something bucks. And so we could, who knows what we'll do with it in terms of lining the walls of our home, but these are the sorts of things that have a decent chance of defeating stray bullets, which may someday be trucking around town because people are trying to smoke each other or whatever. But it's not only a, 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 at stake here, it's not only a matter of defending yourself against badasses, there might be more disease floating around town and around the country and around the world than there is in these circumstances where we've got these big bureaucratic hospitals and we've got the Center for Disease Control and all sorts of, you know, and, and at least in the first instance, pretty good stuff. Well, and one of the other things we've got going on, and this pertains to the Kevlar sheets and to the, the, the high-tech uh, flashlights, we are the beneficiaries of what is in all likelihood the height of the Industrial Revolution, and by some measures anyway, the height of human history, the golden age of the human race. That it would be possible for stuff like that to be made, the kind of stuff that Frank just showed you. Or this Kevlar stuff, which can defeat 
uh, the, there's all sorts of the different ones can do to you can defeat different sides of lockdown or Browns, you know. Uh, but that this is possible at all, and that it's possible for the average Joe or Gene to buy this stuff for some kind of affordable price. It is unprecedented. Kings, not too many decades, much less generations ago, you know, they would have to hire a bunch of bodyguard types. But those, the, the, they didn't have the horses unless they had big, fat, cement walls in their castles. They didn't have the stuff to defeat those kind of, the, the kind of rounds. But here, yet, the average Joe has a chance to make his own or her own little castle. All right. But not only with respect to big, self defense type things, but even little defense type things against, in this case, not diseases, but owies. You know, here, there's, I've got a bandage, all right? And doggone it, you know, on this, on this bandage it says latex-free sterile. And, you know, I presume it sure as hell looks to me like it's airtight. That is to say, all the, the germs are excluded from this thing. And it's, a, it's paper. And you can go buy a box of these things at any pharmacy. Or you can order a bigger boxes, boxes of boxes online. But you can buy, what do they cost? Five bucks or something for boxes like, for, I don't know, 20 or 50 or whatever it is? Now, this, again, for most of the human history, kings and dictators and emperors and presidents would have killed for some, for things like this. But here we are. This stuff, you know, you could probably, maybe, maybe one of these is, what, a couple blocks from here or a couple of, most people live within X number of blocks. Yeah, okay, yeah, you know, this is, you can, you can go right now and buy a bunch of these things. And yeah, these things will last forever. They've got a shelf life of all but eternity. All right? So it behooves you, no, just about no matter how poor you are, to make sure you've got some kind of stockpile of these things in your home. And if you can afford it, some of these things come with um, antibiotic ointments already baked in, right? And, and, there's, you know, and this is just the beginning of the kind of stuff. You don't need a doctor's prescription or anything. But as I understand it, in prior wars, you know, a lot of soldiers died as of tetanus or whatever because they couldn't, you know, they couldn't get their mitts on stuff like this or obviously bigger. And so this or that infection developed and the medical technology didn't exist to stop them. And of course, obviously, in the Walgreens of the world, they sell them not only like this big, but they sell the big gauzy things and so on. They sell wraps. There's all kind of stuff you can get nowadays. And again, not just in the military field or the medical field. But there's just all kind of stuff you can get which was utterly unobtainable at any price fairly recently in human history. And so the first thing, it seems to me, that you want to do is to think about the sorts of things that might no longer be available if the Industrial Revolution slows to a crawl. If, for instance, stuff like this is made from components or raw materials like rare earths, I don't know, in places like China, half a world away from here, and maybe it's not going to be as cheap for the Chinese to put stuff like this on the boats, for, the, to, for those boats to travel halfway around the world, because oil is back up now near 100 bucks. And for who knows, the way things are going, it might end up being 200 bucks a barrel, and then maybe even 300 bucks a barrel. All right? This is the kind of thinking you got to do. Now, I don't know when it was when they first started to can food. All right? I gather it was sometime in the late 19th century, some such. I have heard a story, I've read a story to the effect that fairly recently somebody dug out of the ocean floor a boat, a ship, with a whole bunch of canned goods that sank over 100 years ago. And as I you know, the story is, they opened the damn cans up, they had folks taste the things, and those folks didn't get botulism or any of that. They could eat the stuff from 100 years ago. Well, so having some canned goods, since you don't think you I don't think you the last 100 years anyhow, having some canned goods with whatever sealing process the Industrial Revolution made possible sounds to me like a pretty good idea. And you can go with all these and get a whole bunch of canned goods for what, two bucks a piece? Sometimes less, depending on the size and the this and the that. Now that's a, these, there's all sorts of preps like this that you can make 
which could make all the difference in the world. And here's, and then, and here's, all right, here's, here's more. Frank, almost every time he gets up here, talks about plastic shit. All right, well, yeah, there's all sorts of plastic shit. I've got at home who knows how many bins and this is and that's of old juice bottles. I guess they must be the 32 ounces. And when I'm done with the juice, I fill them with water. Now, there's all sorts of controversy about the BPA, long-term poisoning of this or that kind of plastic made for these things. Well, you know, if the water system is no longer working, I'm going to end up taking my chances on getting what do you get with the BPA? It's cancer or something 10 or 20 or 30 years down the road? You know, well, I'll, I'll take my chances on getting cancer 30 years down the road. All right, you know, I might not be around 30 years from now. Anyhow, all right. So, you know, a lot of times life is a matter of playing percentages, and there's all sorts of cool things you can do for it. Not much, and in some cases, once you've already spent the money for the juice or whatever, literally nothing, and the water, you just turn the water tap on and fill it up. All right? Now, you know, I, mean, I could, I suppose, you know, go on and on. How much time do I have left, guys? Um, but, Give us about maybe five more minutes, okay, and then I'll cool, rebut. Cool. Yeah, all right, yeah. Well, you know, all right, yeah, you know. Uh, so... You know, there's all sorts, and there's all sorts of things when you buy a frozen meal. A lot of these these frozen meals, healthy choice or whatever, they come in these trays. Now I don't know what I'm going to do with these trays, and I don't know what I'm going to do with, um, you know, how, how all the extra, all the empty cigarette packs, such as in this case, it's for my credit cards. But so on. You know, there's no telling what sort of organizing you might need to do with your stuff. When you get a box, especially if it fits like other boxes where you can put them in a nice pack in a bigger box, uh, you know, you did this, a lot of that sort of stuff if you've got the room, and granted, that may be a consideration for many. But given the limits of your room, it's worth thinking about the sorts of simple things um, that, you, that you can do which might make a world of difference one way or the other down the road when you can't no longer go into the Walgreens of the world and just pick up one of these band-aids anytime you damn well please. And in all likelihood, the society is headed there. Now, there is a great deal of debate among people I read and respect as to you know, how fast it's liable to go bad and how bad it's liable to go once if there's some sort of mega crisis. I will just say this to you folks. We here have what is arguably a, preci a priceless advantage or set of advantages compared to just about everywhere else in the world. Chicago became as big as it became because it is where it is. And it's at the border, if you want to call it that, of two different kinds of things. A, as big a bunch it's at the southwest edge of as big a bunch of you know, rubber reservoirs of fresh water as exists anywhere in the world. And B, to the west of the south of us, is farmland, which is damn near as good as any farmland in the world. And while the human, while the human race may no longer at some point be, uh, you know, afford to be able to buy flashlights like Frank showed you guys, it's going to have to be a little more deep. And so no matter what happens to Silicon Valley and all these other places whose no. days are in all likelihood and number, if there's going to be any civilization at all, assuming Watermelon? we can stop the new plants from no, melting that. down and irradiating the whole planet, and there's a bunch of them around here, if we can stop that, then this place has as good a chance as any as beco at becoming the backbone of what's left of the world economy. And oh, by the way, as the result of the two factors that I just spoke to you about, we have, and Chuck, of course, I'm sure will get, you know, would, would give you a speech about this, we have the mother of all rail networks in the world in terms of the how much track there is, how it's laid out. That's my understanding anyway. Uh, so when, and, and, and it's not really a matter of if, in all likelihood it's when, the oil, the gas-guzzling SUV, as Bob would put it, and all of them, its predecessors, go the way of the dinosaurs, 
as food, the food from this here wonderful granary around us, has to be moved by rail. Well, talk about it. They're either going to send it to Chicago or they're going to send it to Minneapolis, where they've got a big waterfall, where they could literally power, they can literally power the joint with water power from there. All right, we don't have a waterfall, but we've got everything else. So, you know, like with the possible exception of competition from Minneapolis, we're going to be the best game in town. And if the whole joint is going down the drain, if the powers that be have any chance of saving any place at all, and if they've got any sense at all, they will put this place damn near number one on their priority list in terms of what they will save with the limits of their resources. So, okay, well, is that about, are we yes. run out of gas here? All right. I'll go. Unfortunately, I think Jeff has been watching too much of a show called Doomsday Preppers. <laughs> My take on the author, based on the little bit of things I've done on her website and some things, is that the simplicity revolution she's talking about is one that has been driven by the corporatocracy, as she talks about by the over-increase and abundance of the values of consumerism and consumption. I'm going to really briefly give you a little bit of a history of consumerism and then tell you why the author wants us to live a little bit more of a simpler lifestyle. I'll take you back maybe 50 to 100 years with the East India Tea Company and the importation of Chinese silk. And that most people in the royal families, you know, they would get a piece of cloth, or they would get some clothing, and they would wear it. And they had maybe one or two garments that they would use to uh, basically, you know, keep themselves looking good in front of court, and that would last them for years. Well, it was just through the, what they call the importation of the fashion cycle, with the new silks coming in, the new different patterns in there, and of course, the marketing of those silks and things that would change every season or everything else. Somebody would come in with a new look and then they would have to get all the new stuff related to it. They would have to do and move on to things to get things in here. There you have the invention of what they call the one of the things that has driven modern commerce and it's called the fashion cycle. Other other items that have been useful are, you know, a lot of the stuff that we've done has been making our lives easier, you know, with the economies of scale and and the increases in transportation and the increases in various other forms of transport. We all know that our world has changed. We all know that our technology has changed and we have been on the cusp of one of the most fundamental revolutions since the printing press and that's been the widespread availability of information via the internet. And as a matter of fact today, you know, Mayor Rahm Emanuel is talking about the digital divide and a lot of poor homes don't even have internet access. And that's now getting to be an almost essential part of daily life. I think what our author is saying though is that can we continue on with this further increase in consumerism, this further expanded increase in our global economy, our further uh, expansion into uh, into bringing a better quality of life for everybody else. We in the United States haven't really seen it because in around the 1930s, some auto executives in, uh, in Detroit were worried that, you know, Americans now have almost everything they need. Why would they want to buy more? Well, needless to say, we had the invention of the modern marketing device. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, its inventor. I. It was, his name was his name was his name was Henry Bernays, and he was the father of the Edward, Mark, Edward, Bernays. Edward Bernays. You thank Edward you, Bernays. Don. And this gentleman basically had started, you know, the mass marketing campaigns that we've seen all over the country. He is most famous for promoting the smoking of cigarettes amongst women. And what did he do? He basically took a bunch of fashionable ladies around the time of what they called the Easter Parade in New York City, which was one of the biggest times that all the men and women of the city would come out in their finery after their church services and stroll down, you know, Park Avenue or whatnot. 
So what this guy did was he took these, he took some very fine uh, women who, about five of them fashion models, and he had them smoking down Fifth Avenue, and it was scandalous. But it was picked up by the local media and, of course, fashion magazines, and, of course, all of a sudden, the sales of cigarettes went up. By the way, in an ironic twist of fate, he also did a lot of work later in life for the American Lung Association to reverse the very thing that he had started. If we fuck them, then we save them, right? <laughs> so, needless to say, we have seen with the invention of the fashion cycle, the inventions of modern transportation, and of course now the inventions of modern marketing, ways that industry has kept our consumerism and our propensity to spend new stuff alive and well. And if you think that it's not alive and well, you just simply take a look at our electronics revolution with the new cell phones that come up. We have 3G, we have 4G, and it changes so fast that nobody can even keep up anymore. However, our author is, from what my understanding is, is just wanting to get more back into the human relations side of, of things. Figuring out what your priorities in life are. Is it really so expansive to spend and spend and spend? I think with our economy and the way we've been seeing things, a lot of people have been realizing and readjusting their values their own life and readjusting and, re and reverberating what is really important. And I do know that since the terrorist attacks of 9-11, there has been a lot of people thinking about what is important in life. For me, it's, it's to me, you know, you know, I joined a few organizations, but we'll talk about that later on. I don't think that we're going to see an imminent economic collapse. I don't think we're going to be seeing a general slowdown in, our, in the worldwide economy. We just have too much invested in it. And if for some reason we see the downing of a power grid, it'll, it'll be a, a lot of government money, a lot of things to get it back up and running because people will demand it. They'll want the revolutions to get it through. And I just don't see, short of maybe a general nuclear attack, of a real way that it goes down. If we find the price of oil too high, we'll figure out another way to innovate another cheaper source of energy. If we figure out, you know, if we do something else, we'll do it. What I think that individually we can do, though, is think, well, what is important to us? Is that new phone system that you want to get an, an important idea? Is just a, something that we're going to be spending our money on to get later on? Or are we going to take that money, maybe save it up and have a you know, a good long dinner with a friend at a nice restaurant somewhere that might not be as, that might generate a better relationship. In, in many times, I have just recently gone through some work at my church over in uh, Huntley, Illinois, and they've been talking about this very topic, about simplifying your life and getting back to what is called the basic value of human relationships spending time with your family, spending time with your wife, attending events like this live to learn a little bit more about what you do and what you can do to take things. Now, instead of me rambling on and on, I think that at this point, I'll let uh, Jeff rebut me real quick, and then I'll do a couple closing remarks, and then we'll take your questions. Jeff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, fine. fine. All right. Well, all right. Um, you know, the, 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 a lot of what Jim says about the idea of simplifying, those I certainly have no trouble with. Probably the statement he made, which I should subject to the most scrutiny, is his idea that if we run out of oil, we'll come up with something else. <laughs> well, Sir, I, you know, it is, it is certainly imaginable that some people, maybe many people, will try. It is also possible, you never know, that some of our elites are so deranged that they might actually try to, to, to sabotage it. I, you know, I don't know what to say about these people, I, but I must say to you that, again, over the last 15 years, give or take, in this country, the malgovernance has been of such magnitude that we have to at least consider the possibility that it was delivered. But, all right, leaving that aside, let's assume for the sake of argument <clears throat> that, that uh, somehow those people are moved off, pushed off to the side, and that you know the, the, the folks who want to fix things are actually allowed to do it unimpeded, unsabotaged. Well, all right, 
just because they want to, and just because virtually everyone else wants them to succeed, it doesn't mean they will. A lot of time, my sense of the history of the growth of the Industrial Revolution is that it didn't happen overnight. There were a number of steps taken arguably over centuries to set the table. It's not the sort of thing you can make happen overnight. And if we end up running out of oil, we may be in a situation sort of analogous to where folks were in, say, 1700 or some such, in the sense that we may very much regret not having made plans to move things along. Because you see, the trouble is, for starters, the modern economy is hooked on oil. Now let's say that we don't have a plan to move off of oil, and for some reason or another, oil gets up to 150 bucks or 200 bucks a barrel. And we don't have a plan, we don't have our ducks in order already for alternative means of running the show. I don't believe we're going to be able to just turn around on a dime and be able to feed coal into our gas tanks or into the gas tanks of the trucks that bring the diesel fuel to the new plants so that the new plants can run instead of melting down. Now, Frank, I'm sure, you know, Frank could probably give you a speech as to the details of if, if I've got that sense right of how it has to go. Um, but let's assume, regardless of what I'm right about the specifics of what I just said about new plants and diesel, my sense of it is that the society is so hooked on this stuff that there are a whole bunch of tanks, so to speak, <laughs> which cannot just suddenly take some other substance than what they're designed to take. And unless ducks are lined up, unless we have not only strategic oil reserves, but strategic coal reserves, and maybe strategic <laughs> silver reserves, and we could go on and on, phosphorus as I understand, maybe we're at peak, peak phosphorus, <clears throat> we better have a whole bunch of strategic reserves of a whole bunch of different kinds of things, it seems to me. But from what I can tell, because our darling friends in the media would way rather talk more about whether it's how Michael Jackson died or how Nicole Brown Simpson died or what's going on with Tom Cruise, then they would, they'd rather talk about that stuff than they would about such facts as I understand it, that the human race reached peak per capita oil back in 1979, about 33 years ago. Yeah, and yet, how many Americans, or Chinamen, or whatever, know that fact? I just read it this in the last week or so, such. Yikes. And by the way, as you know, I, I tried to trace the steps as to the folks when this, when this fact first emerged. My, it, it has to have emerged in the past 10 years, as I understand it, because the, the ASPO, I'm forgetting, the, the Association for the Study of Peak Oil, that outfit's only been around for 10 years. And oh, by the way, there was one American sort of involved in it. But he doesn't even have a geology. He's not a professor of geology or anything. He's just a guy. I don't remember his credentials. It was founded by Swedes and other Europeans. So as recently as 10 years ago, except for one dude, maybe he had an engineering degree or something, I forget. No, nobody in America was thinking about anything about this at all. Although, by that time, it had already been 23 years since we'd reached per capita peak oil. Well, as long as this society, American society, handles the important issues like that as, to be polite about it, lackadaisically, as they've been doing, I will be a monkey's uncle if we see the elites in this country actually get down to business and take serious steps to get us ready for what in all likelihood seems to be coming down the road. And as an example of the sort of thing, leaving aside the strategic stockpile thing per se, the sort of thing that needs to be discussed but isn't, is a change in the tax structure such that 
they won't be able if to you charge. build if you cut down a tree and you plant a new one okay we won't tax you no it'll take a couple decades but we'll live with that i suppose but that's at least defensible but if you drill a hole in the ground and you pull a bunch of oil out and you can't put any oil back in or anything that's going to grow oil as i understand <laughs> Well, then we're going to tax your ass pretty doggone heavily. And in, 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 in exchange, we will lower everybody else's taxes on everything else. In order to give the incentive to, net, to make as much do as the same would go with what stuff you pull out of the ground instead of selling it for a couple bucks or so a gallon so that folks can drive around in, as Bob Manor puts it, gas-guzzling SUVs. Now, if Bill Gates wants to pay, you know, I don't know, would it be, should it end up 12 bucks a gallon, 120 bucks a gallon, to drive around in a gas-guzzling SUV? Oh, well, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll put up with that, and we'll get some revenue out of it. But as it stands, from what I can see, this society, the American people, are more or less systematically kept in the dark as to the difficulty of the circumstances. Over the last 30 years, give or take, the human race threw the greatest party in history. We dug out the North Sea oil. Now the Brits are oil importers rather than exporters. It is, it's, as I understand it, just a matter of time before the Mexicans become oil importers rather than exporters. And so whether we are at peak oil in the literal sense Maybe they can dig a few more wells like the Saudis. Maybe they can ratchet up the speed of emptying their wells faster than they have been up to this point. And maybe we can get to a few more barrels per year than we got to five or whatever years ago. But seeing that we got, what, how do we got seven or so billion people on the planet now? How are we going to keep all those SUVs going? <laughs> but here we are. We've still got folks driving around in them. Like, this oil just grows on trees. It's like grabbing a pear off the tree and just squeezing the pear, and the juice just comes out. Okay. No, that's, the, that's where we're living. We're living as if the party can go on forever. Yeah. And we don't need to think about what we might do to try to ease the transition for the day when we'll have to substitute coal for oil, and then, no doubt, in due course, we're going to have to substitute who the hell knows what for coal. Okay. Well, I don't know. I'm, I'll look into putting solar panels somewhere on my property. Sorry. Well, okay. Well, I mean, who knows? This there's all sorts of discussion about what's going to be able to get to make be made to work, how fast, how safely, all of that. Yeah. Well, we got to have the discussion. Now, there's places on the web where you can read all sorts of good discussions about this stuff. Yes. All sorts of websites, but. None of these people who write cogently on the web about stuff like this are remotely as well known as Daniel Jurgen, the mainstream media's go-to guy, who back, oh, what was it, maybe eight years ago, maybe less, said, oh, oil, it'll get up to 38, 40 bucks, something like that. And it'll level off at 38 bucks. And that'll be the average, and that'll be it. No sweat, folks. Well, they just, they still try him out. He's the, he's the go-to guy. They don't tell you what he said about 38 buck a barrel oil right. way back then. <laughs> Much less tell you about all the folks way back then who said, uh-uh, no, it ain't gonna stay at no 38 bucks a barrel. Oh no, you don't hear their name. So we've got a hell of a media system in this country systematically keeping the American people in the dark of all sorts of considerations, all sorts of, sorts of alternatives pertinent to those considerations. And they do what is called BAU, business as usual. And Jeff, there you go again, telling us that we're doomed and gloomed because of our oil for addiction. I will simply concur that Jeff may be right about our oil addiction, and it might be time to change the grid to certain other structures. Now, back in here on July 15th, we had a gentleman by the name of John Coons from the Thorium Alliance tell us about a different type of nuclear power that might be a short answer for basic baseload power. And if you start looking, too, at the advances of solar panels and wind turbines and 
some of the other alternative uh, energy projects, it's alive and well. And there's a ton of companies out there coming up with real solutions to real problems. Why is it? Because we allow them to innovate. We allow them to move forward. As a matter of fact, if, have you, if, it, if any of you guys have looked around the auto industry lately, I myself was just at the auto show last February and drove an all-electric vehicle that was available for sale from Nissan. I also, too, had a, was able to drive a vehicle called the Chevy Volt, which was part gas and part all-electric, but had a gas backup generator on it. And with, with the sales worldwide of the Toyota Prius, I'm starting to see that we're maybe beginning to think about our oil addiction to get off it a little bit more. And I'm finally beginning to see some serious discussion about base load electric power being generated by wind and solar panels, battery technology improving, and yes, and yes, the consideration of an industry that hasn't been allowed to innovate in 40 years, the nuclear power industry, oh. being available for perhaps what I consider a, a real breakthrough, molten salt fluoride, I'm sorry, liquid fluoride molten salt reactors. Now, I'm not going to get into the technical discussions tonight on that, but I do see a potential for a lot of change. The bottom line is this. I don't think we can stand still anymore. As a matter of fact, I still consider the greatest invention in the last hundred years to be the structure of the modern corporation and the development of the stock and revenue bond. <laughs> what? They have been able to pull together capital so that you can invest in things, so that the average person can get enough money together to make the fundamental innovations around the world. And if you doubt that it doesn't exist, you just take a look at the 1990s and how fast we were able to wild the world with uh, fiber optic cable, which allowed the cost of phone calls and data transmission to go down quite significantly to, so that it was where, so that companies could theoretically outsource their businesses to India. I mean, at one point, that was unheard of because we couldn't do calls cheaply enough. That's, really good. That's a good thing. Now, what's been finding is that uh, a lot of companies are coming back to insource too in America because they find that there's a little something called the cultural divide. You actually need people that you can talk to when you have a problem with one of these complicated devices. Anyway, the simplicity revolution simply means you need to take a good, long, hard look at your life. What is important to you? Is that having the latest and greatest gadget really the end all to end all, as a lot of the modern corporate marketing departments think? Or is it having a, a good, sustainable relationship <laughs> with your family and your friends, or the pursuit of a hobby or something else that you can dedicate your time and life to? Yeah. Personally, I like my electronics. I have a passion for video, so I buy stuff that helps me pursue that passion. I have a car, it's old, but it does give me some decent gas mileage. But if I was to make my next major purchase, it's probably going to be the, uh, another vehicle in the next five or ten years. And frankly, I'm hoping my next one could be an all-electric vehicle that would give me about a 300-mile range. But if not, I'm going to be still stuck with maybe an electric car that's got a gasoline generator back. And yes, people, it's coming. Yes, people, I we have seen in the last 30 years, maybe not America not doing as well as it did, but we have seen the rest of the world industrialize. We have seen the rest of the world come up in living standards. Thomas Friedman in his book, The World is Flat, has often talked about the innovation engine and the three, the, the, and how globalization has benefited mankind. I don't think it's going to stop. We may have a little glitch in the road with our economy, but I don't think it's going to stop. And with that, I'll conclude my remarks. Since we don't have the experts, right. can we just so make comments and rebuttals? Uh, yeah. yeah. Questions. Questions. Questions are for experts. Yeah. We'll go. We'll go. We'll brief. We'll go. Yeah, we'll go. 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 We'll go.
I mean, let's let's get real. They're, they're, all, hardly any of the speakers at the college are experts. Yes, right. Well, right. You guys both well, well right. but the speaker well. didn't show up. I want to make a comment, two comments. One is about the potential of having plentiful of an alternative energy, and the other is about the genetically modified seeds. Uh, first, uh, we do have a potential source of energy, inexhaustible, clean, abundant, and environmentally clean. Uh, but this, to, to obtain this to the, to the level to maintain society as we know it, it will take 40 to 50 years. We know the technology is, is, is simple and it has to do with obtaining hydrogen directly from solar, from, from photons, not from photovoltaic, but directly converting sun energy into hydrogen. And the process is a process that it was used during the Second World War as to how do you recover uh, CO2 and convert it into liquid gasoline. Um, if you want to learn more about it, I can explain you the chemical process to produce this. And um, as I said, the system is solved, except that it will take a long time, a lot of fossil fuels to make this a reality. If we burn the fossil fuels, as we are doing now, we will be out in the dark. However, if we do find that source of energy, abundant, clean, inexhaustible, we will destroy the world in no time. With the amount of people that we have, if we have that source of energy, then we are really burning the world in, in maybe 10 years or less. We will wipe the forest, uh, fish the seas, uh, have a lot of air conditioning houses and all that, which all requires mining minerals, building roads, destroying the environment. So this is not a solution to have an abundant source of energy. The next is the genetically modified seeds. It's not a concern about whether modified genetically modified seeds is a health issue. The issue is that once you tolerate and you allow these modified hybrid seeds to take hold on the whole world, then you lost your native seeds and you are permanently forever dependent on these Monsantos and others who produce these seeds. This is a monster that we cannot tolerate. We are enslaving off our own this uh, manufacturing and the way it's done and without concern for anything. But to be dependent on a company like Monsanto, like in India and in Argentina now, where they produce the seeds and they remove the native seeds from the markets and make people completely enslaved, dependent on buying every year the seeds to the next planting. Now these seeds are not as they are meant to be, as they are advertised for, they require a very methodical uh, process of uh, irrigation on the right time, the planting is today, a week from today the seeds need water, then after a month they need water, unless you have fuel, petroleum products to irrigate, then these seeds are no good because depending on the rain, the rain is not going to come a week from now, it's going to come when it comes, and then it's not going to repeat a month from now. So uh, whenever these disease were implemented in India, for example, the people have suffered tremendous losses and irreparable <coughs> loss of life. So all right, let's that's all. We're going to do a quick question and answer period, then we have a lot of time for rebuttals tonight, so if you want to start moderating, Brown, we'll go at it, and Jeff, we'll just get these questions over with. Thank you, Frank, for your insights. I know you have your hand up before Don Frenchie now. <laughs> All right. Don? Okay. Well, I actually, I have a question for 
Jeff, first of all. I actually have two questions, one for Jeff, one for Tim. But should I just do one question and one question only and then go to the next question asker? Yeah, do, do the two. Do the two. Two questions at once. Okay. Well, my question for Jeff. Okay. Well, I can understand that. My question for Jeff first. Um, you, who are the elite? Who rules America? Well, I don't know. And it almost doesn't matter. But I'll tell you this. It's not only who rules the matter. It's the, maybe the more, the more important question to me, in my analysis, isn't who rules America, but rather who gives them the pass that they've been given mm -hmm. in the past 15 years or so. All right? It's the giants that the American system is built on checks and balances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's a First Amendment making, you know, the, making the, the, the media the fourth estate. And it was their job, yes, thank you. It was, it, was the, you know, the, it was the job of the media to blow the whistle on whatever the elites did. One of the most influential books in my life was a book called Voltaire's Bastards by a certain John Ralston Saul, the last chapter of which is called The Faithful Witness, where he lays in, goes into the history of the evolution of the media in terms of its ability fluctuating to blow the whistle on the bastards. All right. Uh, my question, okay. My my question for for you, Tim, is right. um, you were talking about the electric cars that have been coming out lately. And <coughs> now I might be wrong about this, but didn't didn't all these companies at least adopt the electric? Didn't these companies start adopting electric cars because of uh, because of pressure from government or from other governments? You know, Ron, I, I'm very familiar with your thing, and uh, I am also aware of the EV1 that came out and was produced and was subsequently uh, destroyed by General Motors mm -hmm. at the time, and that there were certain decisions made that we don't want this right now, mm -hmm. and that there is a lot, sometimes a lot of evil that goes on in the name of uh, yeah. corporate greed and things like this, and I think a lot of times that's exactly what happened to Detroit. They were very greedy in getting their cars marketed. They had their their marketing on their big SUVs, the big monster machines that would cost about thirty thousand dollars. They could make about yeah. maybe two to twenty five hundred bucks per vehicle versus the smaller cars which could, they could only make about a thousand dollars on. Now I think a lot of times that it's a matter of two things. Yes, number one is government pressure, but I think the more effective way that the SUVs were put out of business was with the increase in gas prices. Mm -hmm. And I think that now that people are really concentrating on gas at one to two dollars a gallon, most people can you know, afford to fill up a, a truck or a car. When it gets to four and five dollars per gallon, that's when you really have to start thinking: Do I get a more efficient vehicle, or do I get a more efficient way of doing things? And again, it was done through the pricing mechanism that's done that good old capitalism provides. We have oil that's scarce. We have high gas prices. People want to buy a more fuel-efficient car, and that means too that in order to increase efficiency, uh, electric comes in. Uh, alternatives come in and other ways of moving things forward come in and that's uh, essentially what's going to happen now I think one of the reasons that we're with this energy thing we have is oil will continue to go up in price it'll be more profitable to bring solar panels wind turbines and other things online okay Joe Mayer uh, for Jeff uh, <clears throat> given your propensity for thinking about a uh, limited doomsday scenario. Don't you think it would be better uh, than all of the things that you mentioned? Wouldn't it be better to stock up on Twinkies and learn how to brew beer from waste water? <laughs> <laughs> to say the least, I don't know enough about Twinkies, Twinkies and brewing um, to, uh, to answer that question in any appropriate way. Insofar as I'm missing your drift, and if you want to rephrase it, well, Martin. Question for Jeff, real quickly, Martin. Yes. You didn't mention in the things that you were talking about stockpiling 
an AK-47 or uh, RPGs or anything like that. Oh, yeah. Isn't that well, sort of the universal yeah. currency after Doomsday? Oh, well, I do. let me put it to you this way. Yeah, that's some, something along those lines goes without saying. Part of what I wanted to drive at. I, I guess I'm a little slow. I didn't. No, no, I didn't. I didn't. Stuff. You know, there was a, there was enough fish to fry, uh, without getting into those kind of specifics. Um, one of the points of mentioning the band aids is that things like bullets, band and band aids, and I'm sure there's other stainless steel screws. Those things, in addition to having to being very important in certain kinds of scenarios. <clears throat> are small and fungible, and otherwise they're, they're enough like each other that they may turn out to be the currency of the future, the currencies of the future. Oh. I mean, what a corollary to that. I, I was going to say, Jeff, that it appears that the ultimate fungible medium is, is bullets and guns. Well, bullets, band-aids, and you have to do what? Okay. And did you realize that it was bullets, guns, and other items that, re that were the, one of the first items that were traded around the world? That the markets for weapons were one of the first things that were actually traded? Now, one more thing. Bullets are pretty damn heavy. There's only so many that you're going to be able to carry in your pocket. Band-aids might turn out to be like pennies or nickels or dimes because you can put dozens or hundreds of them in your pocket. I want to keep the bullets in my Kevlar right. house. Charles <laughs> <laughs> Paydock? Yeah, uh, I don't know either one, but primarily Tim. Now, historically, societies have been comprised of self supporting farmers who may have had some surplus, but now your world that you're so fond of is this complex corporate technological market-based thing that appears to me to be fragile and can fall apart if any one element doesn't work. Is that a good position to be in? All I'm going to say, Charlie, is this. How many of you really want to go back to substance farming for a living. Today we have less than 3% of our, of our people engaged in agriculture. The rest of us engage in other ideas and everything else. And for me, what I unsee with, um, with, with this type of thing is I much prefer to live in this world than I would in one where you have a bunch of subsistence farmers. The question is, yeah. Yeah. if one of those variables in your technological world screws up, we're in big trouble, like he says. Yep. And there's many of them, you know, there's a hundred of them, right. or more. If just one of them goes awry, we're in trouble. To a, to a large extent, I would agree, but let's just hope that don't happen in trouble because one thing that corporations and countries do is they have a little bit of an element of self-survival. Yeah, trouble is, um, Tim, that my sense of them, especially in this country, is that their c conception of what is long-term is six months or something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, we, you know, and, and Chuck is getting to a, a very important point or set of points. So if I can, I want to elaborate. I want to expand on this. I, I'm pretty sure I referred earlier to. The idea that even something as simple as a Band-Aid in the right kind of paper that's sterile, I don't know the specifics, but it could very well depend on all kind of chemicals or this is or that's from any number of derived from raw materials extracted from any number of places all around the world. And so if all it takes is the weakest link in the chain to cease to be effective, and there might not be no low productions of Band-Aids. All right. Now, therefore, yeah, the, that's, you know, there's no telling when this, that might happen, where this or that commodity, even if it's still available, might be too expensive for the bean counters in this or that corporation to consider to be worth their while for them to continue to make band-aids. And so they might decide, well, now I guess we're going to have to make beanie babies. <laughs> or whatever, you know, uh, all right, and, 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 and therefore, the, 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 since that is a realistic prospect in these circumstances, one of the things we can do is not only go to the Walgreenses of the world and stock up on the Band-Aids, 
But you can go on something like Amazon.com and you can look up, you know, a given item, whatever it is, and not only can you see there's going to be all sorts of dealers hawking that item, but then you can also go to the individual items page of Joe Blow Dealer and you get readers' comments. Gee, you know, I tried, I've, yeah, I've used this insect spray and it works real well on mosquitoes. It doesn't work quite as well on wasps or whatever. Okay? That! Kings! You know, back not too many decades or so ago, if a king wanted to know how good a product was, as far as how the average Joe or Jane felt about it, he'd have to send agents out into the countryside, and it might take them weeks or months or who knows how much to come back with the skinny. And here you, it's going to take you a few minutes maybe to get the skinny that it took these guys weeks or months to get. So this, we are in the golden age of the human race. And so, yeah, whether you're allergic to bees and wasps like me or whatever it is, Think in terms of, gee, what are the kinds of things that I might really, really need bad five years down the road? If things go to hell, they might, it might be five months, it might be five years. It's probably not going to be 25 years. It's probably going to be sooner than that, to a substantial degree. And read those reviews on what they say about whatever it is that is a high-tech thing that may not be available when things start to go down. I'm just going to simply talk to Jeff. Here he is telling you about how our world's going to hell in a handbasket, and he's praising all the change in technologically availability of information. So I hope we don't have anything happen, but I don't think it will. All right. My question is probably to Jeff, but since uh, Jim didn't read much of it, but anyway, the question about. <coughs> <clears throat> the question about God, and the question for me is, you know, you stack up on uh, band-aids and, and God. So my question is, who is your target when you well, focus God? Oh, look, <clears throat> the scenario with respect to guns, in particular, is that enough of the cops, and it's either A, the cities can't afford to, to keep on paying as many cops as they've got on the force already, or B, it gets so bad that the cops, that they feel they're so outgunned that they just hunker down in their home. Now there's who knows how many different scenarios similar to those, such that one way or the other, there may not be enough cops around to put enough of the fear of God, as the saying goes, into the bad guys, and so they decide, they, they think they've got a, 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 a blank check to go around and do whatever they damn well please to whoever they please. Like New Orleans. That's, there you go, right, right. And the federal government took its sweet time and about to, to help the folks in New Orleans, and I, my sense of it is there's some parts of New Orleans that still don't have effective police patrol. So, you know, the, and the chances are, the way it's going to go, is that certain parts of the country will lapse into, into a state like that and stay there. Other parts, the cavalry may come. My guess is the cavalry is going to come here before almost any place else. But there's, and I, in principle, there's probably an infinity of scenarios under which you could have a slow decline, maybe with fits and starts, in various places in the country at various times. Uh, Ivan, uh, okay. yeah, you folks spoke uh, concerning numerous topics and maybe your criticisms regarding those numerous topics. And I I'm thinking that most of those topics, at least at present and maybe not well, I mean, for the criticisms, are decided by the marketplace. Uh, and I want to focus, Jeff, on what you mentioned with respect to the media and your criticism that maybe in the last 25 years, those shows that educate the masses are not presented by the media to our to the doom of the masses, uh, at least by your judgment. And uh, my thinking is because maybe under the marketplace there's no demand. Uh, the production of those shows, well, there's no well, demand well, to supply them well, unless okay. government yeah. intervenes and subsidizes okay. them. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. even if it does, are, are they going to trap us in a room and show us a movie to well, educate look, us? Look. 
And well, if they, if they do that, won't we just be bored and daydream well, away? Well, first off, look, the notion that there is a free market, a meaningful free market in the American media, especially TV and radio, which are after all licensed, is problematic at best to begin with. There's no, I don't see any reason to believe that there's any more of a intrinsic, authentic groundswell among the American people for Daniel Yergin. <laughs> as opposed to any of the other folks who comment. How about New Jersey housewives? You could just, you know. No, but the point is, how many of them know the They don't give a damn whether they see Daniel Jurgen or whether they see the kind of guys I read. Most of them don't know any better. The, the media has something called the agenda-setting function. If, you know, they, they can either do it conscientiously and have fair debates between the Jurgens of the world and his critics of the kind that I read, or they can just keep on trotting out the Jurgens of the world over and over and over again so that these housewives in New Jersey have no idea that anybody anywhere in the world disagrees with Jurgen. And it's not, I don't mean to pick on Jurgen personally, this is true of every single solitary important subject before the American people and the peoples of the world. All I'm going to say on it is to quote a guy from 1890, William Randolph Hearst, Blood and Guts sell papers, and gossip brings in the news. And it's been going on since time immemorial. How in the fucking hell is that going to help anything? Well, <laughs> so, so, okay, so, so, I mean, maybe the, oh, I'm sorry. I'm just oh, thinking, okay. all right, maybe the, uh, you can make it in yeah. All right, Bernie Connie. Yes, a uh, couple oh, of questions. Uh, what you're talking about with major media uh, being bullshit, I would have to agree with you in so many terms. But do you think there's a ray of hope with uh, alternative media, such as, say, The Reader or The Huffington Post? Okay. The Reader is a spit in the ocean. So, respect to The Reader, almost certainly not. It's been around for decades, and it's had minimal impact from what I can tell. Okay. No. The, 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 the same old stuff pretty much still happens, from what I can tell. I'm not an expert on it, but that's my sense of the situation. With respect to the, the Huff Post of the world you're talking about, I take it about the website. The web has a chance. Now, in all likelihood, if the web ever really gets to be a threat, the powers that be will fix their essence, one way or the other. Now. Having said that, it is a very good thing that the web exists for those of us who can read between the lines in this culture and have a better idea of where to go. So yeah, whether it's the whether it's HuffPost or Amazon.com or the oil drum, and I could rattle off dozens of sites that one way or the other are very much, are, are gargantuanly better than what you see on TV. And, and on what TV. pardon? Okay. Don't yeah. even own a TV. Okay, fine. We're not, in, the, in the mainstream media, the mainstream media is for the most the, the, the newspapers. They're for the most part along for the ride. Okay. Um, but yeah, the fact that that there is, you know, that it's possible for at least some people anyway. It's but yeah, to, to to at least make a difference in their lives. But if they ever get, if they ever get behind a Kucinich or a Ron Paul or whoever it is. That guy, if that guy ever gets anywhere near power, in all likelihood, they'll either do him like they did J.F.K. or like they did Spitzer. Okay. <laughs> uh, we'll take this as a last question. Yes, uh, Mike Foley. I'd like to ask a step. Have you really given any serious thought as to try the future? I agree with your idea of doomsday, but you think there might be some cataclysmic event where our society, our economy, everything will collapse in a week? Or do you think it's more likely that everything will just continue to slowly deteriorate and deteriorate, essentially, as far as the eye can see? That's a good question. Among the folks I read, it is very hotly debated. I'll just give you three names. You've got Jim Kunstler, James Howard Kunstler, and um, Dmitry Orlov on one side who lean to the, at some point, uh, a gargantuan collapse. And the main leader of the other side, which he is a guy named John Michael Greer, he is the arch-druid of the druids of America. 
And he's looking at what he calls catabolic collapse, whereby you have a major crisis, but then you have something of a rally, major crisis, something of a rally, and he's looking at a process over two, a couple centuries, give or take, whereby the two centuries from now, maybe the world will have a billion people. Something like that. And my point is, for us here in Chicago, we don't know which one of those is going to be the deal. But at least here, if there's any place that's going to be helped to rally, it's going to pretty much have to be here. Because of how the rest of the country, if not the world, is dependent on the food that comes from the ne this neck of the woods. I'm not so much worried about an imminent collapse of the world through a catastrophic event. I'm more worried about the general <coughs> collapse of society through uh, what, what, what uh, in Ayn Rand, in her book, Atlas Shrugged, calls the moochers of the world. <laughs> <laughs> Those people that corporations who rely heavily on government subsidies, people who rely more or less on government subsidy and don't produce anything. Now, I'm not saying that it's not that, they do, that the government does not have a role in the world because it definitely does. What I'm thinking, though, is that the trend has been more towards government uh, taking care of you than you taking care of yourself. And that's where I really see the uh, collapse of society coming down over of a long haul. Now, I think me and Jeff have spoken enough, and the Tom is uh, ready to go into questions. All right. We already have three runners uh, lined up here. We have three, four, five. Because that's how many uh, musical chairs we have uh, up here. How many of you, how many of us want to say something to the rest of us? Keep it simple. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine. All oh, right, that's a start. We can go about eight minutes, Brom. What? About eight minutes. Yeah, well, I don't think you're you're going to use all of you eight minutes. Please. About six minutes. I'm going to give you five minutes. And then uh, okay. you'll have to come back for a second round if we have time for it. All right. Those are moochers. Right. <laughs> Starting with Joe Mayer. Don't turn it off. This is not very stable. This was the most complex discussion of simplicity. <laughs> but uh, if you really want a, a simplistic answer, all you have to do is listen to the creationists. Uh, they have it all tied up very neatly. The world was created, six, the universe was created 6,000 years ago, and they're becoming more and more influential in their simplicity as it goes. This is from a, a British journal called The New Scientist. Um, it seems that, uh, <coughs> what can it be like to be inside the head of creationists? They want to believe that their deity made all the species at once and kept them all that way. Right. Yet Earth is teeming with fossils of extinct species. What's going on? Weren't there by the devil to tempt us? That's right. <laughs> well, if the deity is a trickster, the answer is easy. He put it to put the fossils there to cause interminable arguments. Okay, uh, but this this there's a Christian fundamentalist group called the U.S. Accelerated Christian Education Program, and it's for parents who believe, who want their children to believe in a literal reading of the Bible. Um, they have a textbook, a biology textbook. They call it Biology 1099. And it claims that scientists are becoming more convinced of the existence of dinosaurs, current existence of dinosaurs. And it asks the students whether they've ever heard of the Loch Ness Monster. And they use that then. They say that uh, 
Uh, scientists are, have used small submarines to sonar detect the, the Loch Ness Monster. It's been described by eyewitnesses and photographed. And it appears, if they say, that uh, Nessie uh, is a plesiosaur, which is not a dinosaur, by the way. Um, but they also have another book called, um, uh, what was it? Uh, well, the, 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 these, these materials produced uh, are being produced by, through the, uh, uh, what's the name of the outfit? Bob Jones University. Oh, yes. Bob, good old Bob Jones University. At Bob Jones University Press. And uh, they have uh, used a lot of these materials through the voucher program. Um, the voucher program in Louisiana and six other states allow people who don't want to send their children to public schools for whatever. They give them a voucher and then they can send their kids anywhere they want to any Christian school they want. Um, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, the voucher scheme is really quite, quite clever. Um, in one of their books, uh, the United States History from Bob Jones Press, uh, it says um, the Ku Klux Klan in some areas of the country tried to be a means of reform, fighting the decline of morality. Wow. You know, and they're teaching, they're putting this in textbooks for children to read. Um, they also say that um, in another book called America, Land I Love, another textbook in history, God used the trail of tears. That's the trek that the white people forced on the Indians in South, uh, uh, South Illinois, Missouri, and so forth forced them out into the desert where many thousands died. But that God used this trail of tears uh, to bring many Indians to Christ. Okay? And they even have a mathematics textbook. And they say traditional mathematics texts are not burdened with modern theories such as set theory, statistics, probability, because the laws of mathematics are the creation of God and thus absolute. And this is the stuff that is really simple. That's what we have to think about, right? It, it, we don't have to worry about stockpiling Twinkies or anything like that. We just have to accept that the universe was created 6,000 years ago. Right. Wow. Well, yeah. Um, I, I think that um, in order to really understand all this that we're talking about, people should uh, put some efforts in understanding peak oil, for example. Uh, we produce more oils, more oil per day today than we ever produce. And that is not because we didn't pass peak oil. Because you have to understand peak oil. Uh, peak oil was uh, uh, a discovery or research by an American scientist, and it's, it has proven to be correct. Uh, so we have to understand that. The fact is that we are coming, uh, we are uh, emptying the, the fuel, the fossil fuels that they were deposited or that were created here through millions of years of evolution. Um, the, the electric cars, it's a, it's a good thing to, to think very deeply on it. The, big, the electric car runs on electricity. Electricity is a form of energy. Uh, the electricity is subsidized by coal being subsidized to produce electricity. Uh, it's subsidized by oil producing electricity. It's subsidized by gas producing electricity. And nuclear is also subsidized to produce electricity. Now, then, when you put your car and plug it onto the grid, you are filling it with a subsidized form of energy. That's why you may think that you are paying less. But as a con confounding factor, when you take into <coughs> consideration the pollution and the destruction of yes, the environment that all these types of subsidies permit these industries to produce, then sooner or later, in the long term, we will pay the cost of that 
form of energy. Um, the, the other thing that uh, I, I start talking about, about the problem of hybrid seeds, is, uh, is, is a very interesting uh, phenomenon seeing how the industry is focusing people into thinking about the health effects of the hybrid uh, seeds. But that's not the problem. The problem is what I said before. They are trying to control the world, the food supply of the world. When you have that power, what can stop you from dominating the whole thing? So, it, uh, as you know, there are seed banks in Russia and in Sweden and some in the United States. And this is because we try to prevent losing the genetic materials that create, that have all the plants and, and, and that, that we know. Um, if, we, if we do allow these people to control and remove those seeds from our use as, as a society, we, we, are, we are creating a monster that nobody wants to live under. That would be a dictatorship that you cannot stop. The initial question was, what can we do as individuals, I thought, to uh, reduce consumerism and materialism to deal with uh, uh, a lifestyle that would be simpler. Um, I heard two kinds of uh, discussions here. One was, again, to point out what we, I think, have been uh, discussing forever, and that is the corporations, the uh, corruption of the so-called free market, the media. Uh, the other uh, was giving some simple house maintenance, you know, housekeeping suggestions uh, from band-aids to, uh, to others. And, you know, the list can be long and, uh, you know, taking a shot of showers and setting the thermostat and uh, changing the windows to, to insulate your house better and uh, you know, I've done some of it, I've slept on others. The, the problem is that those things don't take a brain surgeon. I think most of us have enough intelligence to know it, but we don't do it. So what is, what can be practical? One thing that we can do to immune ourselves from that effect that keeps us from doing anything. One is about changing our lifestyle, which has to do with over-consumerism. And the other is to immune ourselves from the effects of the media. Some of you here pointed to the media, but not enough. And Tim, the, uh, what Edward Bernays really did was much more subversive and much more powerful than what you described, taking ladies, pretty ladies, to walk around uh, Michigan Avenue. What he did is he used his uncle's idea of the subconscious and reframed rhetoric to make bad good and good, bad, and slave, free, and so forth. So with the Virginia Slims, what he did is he uses the idea of feminism or suffrage at that time, um, connecting, associating, smoking with freedom. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, this is done today. They use those techniques in all the propaganda, in all the marketing, and in campaigns, in political campaigns. <coughs> the one thing that I've done 20 years ago that helped me a little bit develop my immunity or my critical mind was I got rid of cable TV. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, it will save you money 
Yeah. You don't need it. You you like. I still have a machine. I watch DVDs. I watch films <coughs> that I really like. That I get. Uh, on the internet, you can get. If you Google, you get alternative commentaries to every piece of news that you get. Mm -hmm. But the idea is that the television is the most hypnotizing, the most brainwashing too, because it works on all your senses. Okay? As a specialist in clinical hypnosis, I know that. It, you, you have the visual, the audio, the color, uh, the volume, everything, and the speed. So just get rid of that and find yourself then be able to modulate a little bit the effects of campaigns, marketing, media. May help a little bit. Okay, you know, um, you know, Jeff's a good friend of mine and actually so is Tim and um, I just wanna you know um, and Jeff and I have talked about this stuff before. I'm not as, opt as pessimistic as Jeff about the future. Uh, you know, I, uh, at the same time, I'm also not as optimistic as Tim. Um, now, I, I do uh, a lot of Jeff's ideas about how to take care of yourself are generally good ideas. I agree with a lot of what he said. I also like, you know, uh, a lot of those things I've been doing since the 1990s. Uh, I also like Jeff's idea about, uh, about more heavily taxing, the, uh, taxing oil. I think that's a terrific idea. Uh, however, I think the, the uh, a lot of these ideas, I mean, on the one hand, as you know, as I always pointed out, on the one hand we have Jeff saying, we're done, we're doomed, we're licked, there's nothing to be done, catastrophe's coming, you know, it's all going down, you know, and, uh, and so just hunker down and take care of yourself, and uh, maybe take care of your family, and that's it. Uh, and then on the one hand, we got Tim saying, Oh, looks like my time's up. No, hunker down. Okay, now on the one, other hand, we, Tim's saying, don't worry, everything's going great. Market forces will cause the best possible outcome. So don't, don't worry, uh, don't worry about a thing. Everything's great. In, in my opinion, both ideas are actually prescriptions for doing nothing. Actually, for for not changing anything. Um, what I advocate, what I advocate is, um, and what I am actually doing is I'm trying to change things for the better. I mean, I try to take, you know, I take care of myself. I mean, I guess you all figured that out from my community announcement. But at the same time, I'm also trying to make this a better world. Uh, because I realize that that we can, we can, as individuals, screw in all the squiggly light bulbs we want, like this <laughs> restaurant has in the ceiling, but it's not going to stop global warming. Only government action can stop global warming. And that's why I'm involved in the Sierra Club, because the Sierra Club is actually doing something they're actually trying to do something to stop global warming. And they are succeeding. They got, for, for starters, they got the coal burning power plants in Chicago closed down this year. That was thanks to our campaign. Now, uh, I'm involved in some other things. Let me just show you. I'm wearing, I don't know how, how well you can see this, but I'm involved in Obama for America the, uh, 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 to get him reelected. Not because I think he's the greatest president in, in, in American history, but because I think he's a heck of a lot better than the next most likely guy to win the election, Mitt Romney. Uh, I also am involved in Drinking Liberally, which is a group where you can meet uh, people with views like mine. Right. And I'm also a supporter of, this is the healthcare not warfare. I'm, I'm against these wars, which get a lot of people killed and cost a lot of money and accomplish nothing. And I'm in favor of universal health care. Hey, Charlie, one fool at a time. And I'm also in favor of universal health care. Uh, so, so I'm actually trying to do something to, to make this country a better place for everybody to live in. Now, for me, of course, but also for, for all of you here. And, and, and these programs, what I've just told you about, will, if enacted, uh, make this a better place for all of us. That's, that's what I'm trying to do. Now, I asked Jeff before, who, who are the elite? I'm, I'm gonna. Uh, I, Frank alluded to it a little bit, talking about the genetically modified seeds. The elite, the elite are the multinational corporations, not just not just for America, but for much of the world. And uh, the and the, here's a problem with this idea that corporations are some wonderful beneficent device for creating prosperity. The problem with corporations is that this prosperity 
Whatever prosperity we have is built upon the destruction of the environment. We only have this one planet to live on. We cannot live on Venus or Mars. They are uninhabitable. All right? And, and, and if we destroy this planet, and Frank keeps telling people about this, <coughs> and, and if, if we destroy our own environment, we're not, you know, all this ain't going to amount to jack shit. We're not going to have... Uh, we're not going to have any of this prosperity anymore. We'll be lucky if we can survive in the caves. So, unfortunately, corporations, because they have to have more profits this year than last year and more profits next year than this year, infinite profits, they, that requires infinite growth, which in turn requires eating up more of our environment. And, uh, and, the, and, and even in a conscientious CEO, not a, not a bad man, is going to do that, uh, and otherwise, he's going to have to go looking for another job because the, the stockholders demand a return on investment, and that's how you accomplish it. Now, uh, the other problem is the tragedy of the commons. Uh, how, how many of you are familiar with that concept? Well, basically, okay, I'll just say it real brief that the Boston Common was a grassy area where, where in the 17th century, they gra uh, people, could, people could graze cows. Okay, people could graze cows. All right, well, I just want to say that they had to quit because too many people grazed and, they, and the cows ate up all the grass. We're doing the same thing with our oil and our other natural resources now. Everybody's pursuing their own self-interest and, and, and in the process we're destroying the environment. But no individual has an incentive to, to stop it or conserve the resources. Now, I used to work for an oil company and those, those guys are totally convinced that we're never going to run out of oil. They're totally nuts. Um, and and the other thing, now as far as what Jeff was saying about the media, uh, or I guess both, both guys commented on the media, uh, the idea that the media has just been totally corrupt since William Randolph Hearst is not true. The, it, some of you, back in the days of Walter Cronkite, uh, broadcast news on TV was, was, and on radio was way more objective than it is now. Uh, but thanks to Reagan's deregulation, all that changed. Jeff is my man. Uh, Tim Borgia there is okay. Because I understand him completely because there's a lot of other Tim Borgia. And no insult. I mean, good Tim Borgia. Jeff, uh, very intelligent dude. In fact, I was impressed with Jeff a long time ago. He used to call Milk Robot Show when Milk had all them heavy intellectuals on the on the show, and Jeff would give him a fit. They could just have to send their list to Jeff because <laughs> Jeff knew what he was talking about. However, uh, the, the, tonight is, is oh, well, Jeff, uh, I mean, Jeff, uh, Tim, by the way, said we, he wanted to kind of keep the, the night close to what the speaker would uh, stick to. Uh, and that makes sense to me, too. Now, uh, like, like uh, Ayala uh, started off out there, I'm I don't know about it. They, they, you have a lot of say, Jeff, and y'all were talking about it. We know what, what Tim coming from. Uh, but I can answer Tim first by saying, when Tim mentioned the market and capitalism and all these things, I mean, people, let's be real. I, I, I'll, use this, I'll use it again at the podium. A baseball game is played on a baseball field on the baseball rules with empires in the, everything is scientifically in place. Right. Now, if you move this around, you don't have a baseball game. Now, when Tim mentioned capitalism, I think about the textbook, the textbook version and definition of, of capitalism. We don't have capitalism now because there's no rule. The guy do whatever he wants to do. So, so it, it, it is, that's the market. The market is not free, man. I mean, how can anybody, Stephen Wonder can see, the market is not free. You got monopolies. You got a uh, 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 collusion. You got yep. everything out there. So how in the hell these things will be attacked as though they are real? They are part of the Truman Show. And that's what I call a non reality. The other reality is, but I hope the speaker would have had in mind in following Ayala. There's something an individual can do. I've been doing it all my goddamn life. And that is to do my own thinking. Can't nobody sell me shit. 
I'm going to sell me shit. I'm a buyer. Whatever I want, I go over and get it. What he said got nothing to do with it. Oh, today is Sweetness Day. Your girlfriend would love this. Today is Mother's Day. So and so Christmas is next week. Blah, 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 blah. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> I never had a television in my life. And I came along with a television. And people would shoot you for a television. Come in your house, take your television, and your $100 bills over here with a little something over it, and your civil over there wasn't even touched. That's how important the television was. Like anybody else, I thought a television at that time was important because if you had a television, you would impress the lady a little more. If you had a car, you could impress her even more. And I was into that, but guess what? I didn't have two wood nickels to rub together. <laughs> <laughs> and by the time I got two wood nickels to rub together, a television don't mean nothing to me. A car, I got one, but it doesn't own me. I own the car. Now, what does that mean? Those words I've just said. As an individual, you're going to have to learn what the problem is. And if you know what the problem is, then you can fix, uh, set up a, 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 a way to deal with this problem in some kind of consistent, intelligent way. Now, like what Jeff was talking about, the dip talking about, he gonna take plain cars with a guy with mild cars. That's what Jeff is doing. That's what Bodie is doing, playing with mild cars. Now, they got a scheme to stop him from winning. But they didn't find out he had a mild car. They followed the old standard routine and the official version of doing what you uh, can do in order to overcome whatever problem you have. That's all bullshit, man. They'll tell you about, well, let's elect so-and-so for president. Let's re elect a Republican. Let's re elect this one. All of it's the same. That's the Truman Show. That's the artificial part. And that's the artificial part is you need or artificial part equal to that one in order to overcome that artificial. Because ain't nothing natural that you can do to overcome the people in charge. How in the hell you can overcome the guy with the mild car? How can you overcome the, the, the guy that teach you, the guy that writes your book, the guy that uh, uh, monopolize every energy out there, the guy that done take up your newspaper and, 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 and educate your kids, at least brainwash your kids, and you're going to sit here and talk about, well, we got to do this, and we got to do that. And, so, so, and I'm like, uh, Ma, uh, uh, Margaret said one time to one of certain people was up here, she said, when I come to the Cardo Compact and you give a speech, I leave feeling bad because she said some sort When I come to the Cardo Compact, I leave feeling bad too because I'm almost, I don't understand all these well-read intelligent people can come up time after time and keep on with the official version. Uh, you know, I'm saying how much evidence, how much evidence do you need? The official version is made up. And if you want to attack it, you can't attack the uh, uh, official version with, with some kind of truth and so forth. So. Thank you for having Well, thanks, uh, Tim and Jeff, for your presentations. Uh, well, I, I avoided the uh, car problem myself. My eyes went bad. I was dopey enough to have a car uh, before my eyes went bad. I thought I needed a car to find a girlfriend. That, that never worked for me. <laughs> but anyway, so I don't have to worry about using too much gas. It's uh, shoe leather, mainly. Uh, but uh, this talk reminds me a little bit of this book that was recommended. Yeah, books instead of TV. Good idea. Uh, by a guy named Morris Berman. Uh, why America Fail. Not why it will fail, but why America yeah. Fail. Okay, I have to make a uh, and he takes the uh, idea of, I guess, uh, uh, Pogo, who said something like, uh, I met the enemy and he is us. So he covers, kind of covers that. He said, we in America are, were hustlers right from the start, that all we care about is progress. We don't know where we're going, 
but we're going somewhere, and pro we uh, we uh, worship progress, and we're a bunch of hustlers. We're always trying to get ahead. And his values are something like uh, family, community, uh, crafts, and uh, tradition. And uh, he, he uh, settled the, he uh, took care of the simplicity problem by uh, cutting out. He left. He left the country. He's in Mexico now. You say, well, why Mexico? Well, he claims that in Mexico, nothing works, but everything works out. Here, uh, everything works, and nothing works out. So, uh, it's a, a, a point of view. I would pick up the book. It's very interesting. And it's a uh, idea of simplicity, and again, he left. He's, I guess he's making money off his book in Mexico. Thank you. Is this all right? I'll hold it. Um, I believe I agree that the simplicity, simplicity revolution means getting away from consumerism. Obviously, this is all we're done in this country. Uh, we, in fact, have gotten away from the old time. Uh, saying, which I remember at least from my younger days, of everything in moderation and nothing in excess. So everything's overdone now. We have a mentality that enough is never enough of anything. Whether it's food, a great and rare variety of gadgets, government giveaway programs of all descriptions, and endless choices of merchandise in large stores. Now I'm going to do this, this isn't quite kosher, but I'm going to do this because thanks to the CTA I couldn't get here in time. I went to get on the bus and the bus driver walked away. Mm -hmm. So I was late, so I could not make this announcement. So please bear with me. Uh, this uh, announcement is for Chicago voters. When we go to the polls on November 6th, there will be a referendum on electric power aggregation. Uh, for the city of Chicago, whereby the city can purchase electricity for households and small businesses in bulk, thus costing less in uh, our electric bills would be lower, and hopefully at the same time we would be pushing, uh, they're getting electrical suppliers that use mostly renewable energy, such as from uh, wind power and so forth. Thank you. What's wrong with getting stuff from the government? I'm Michael Foley. <laughs> I said that a couple of weeks ago, I said that I felt that a week from today, next Saturday, is the 77th anniversary of the enactment of the Nuremberg Laws in Germany. And I felt that I believed that that anniversary would be observed here in this country. When the Nuremberg Laws were enacted in Germany, I'm not familiar with all the details, but generally it's acknowledged that those laws said that Jewish people did not have any rights in the country of Germany anymore. In the years after that, there were more and more edicts, but it's thought of as that is the start of officially, legally, lawfully Jewish people had no rights in the nation of Germany. And I felt that a week from today, Saturday, 77th anniversary of that event, the people of this country would realize that none of us in this country have any rights anymore at all. Now, a week ago yesterday, Mayor Rahm Emanuel and Police Superintendent Jerry McCarthy announced that various government agencies would be sending gunmen here to assist the Chicago Police Department. There would be gunmen from the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Drug Enforcement Administration, Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, Internal Revenue Service, and other government agencies 
there was a lot of BS about what they were going to do, but anyway, gunslingers from the Empire do not come here to assist anybody or anything. Gunslingers from the Empire come here to kill us. Don't forget what happened last May. Last May, there were helicopters flying around downtown Chicago with members of the United States Armed Forces in those helicopters pointing rifles at people walking around in downtown Chicago and our government told us the soldiers in those helicopters were practicing to kill people on the ground walking around in downtown Chicago. Now we got gun swimmers from the Empire coming to assume command and control and take over the Chicago Police Department. The, the invasion of our city by the Empire is underway. I don't know how long it's been underway, maybe for several years, but it's underway and it is continuing. Next up is Drew Peterson. If there's any question, the accused shall enjoy the right to be confronted with the witnesses against him. Thank you. If somebody wants to get up here and say they're a big shot lawyer and I don't know what I'm talking about, you can say it. What I said was not my words. I just read that directly from the Sixth Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. So if you want to say the Constitution is bullshit, I'll frankly have to say it is now. Not one person walked into court and said Drew Peterson murdered anybody. Not one person walked into court and said Drew Peterson was anywhere near the victim's house, body, anything. Not one person said Drew Peterson committed any crime and the government did not even say a crime was committed because a paid for government employee, expert, pathologist, inquest guy, autopsy guy, whatever he was, he said the victim died by accident. That was an employee paid for expert of the government. It wasn't Drew Peterson's bullshit lawyer bringing in some doofus. He was an expert paid for by the government. He said the victim died by accident. Another victim, another expert, paid for by the government, said the victim's death was a homicide. By the way, I'm not trying to belittle the victim. Her name was Kathleen Savio. As far as Drew Peterson being accused of anything, <clears throat> I suppose maybe a grand jury indictment is considered an accusation. But it says Drew Peterson has the right to be confronted by the witnesses against him. Nobody from the grand jury showed up and says, hey, I was a grand jury and I accused him of murder. Nobody showed up and says, hey, I testified before the grand jury. I told the grand jury he murdered her. Nobody said nothing like this. There's not one witness against Drew Peterson. There's not one bit of evidence against Drew Peterson. No accusations, no nothing. And he's more than likely going to jail for the rest of his life. <laughs> Well, how about I get the time I'm from the sorry. You've had more than your time. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, uh, the There's time. no fairness, Mike. Mike, that's I'm next. That's not my time. <laughs> you know, the Shakers oh, were a very simple people. <laughs> let us pray, let us pray. Believe it's a life to be simple. Uh, I remember one line from their one of their hymns. When true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend, we shall not be afraid. I think that's the line. <laughs> you know what happened today? Yeah, they died to bow up. and to bend for yeah, yeah. to one another. God didn't yeah. 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 They are in heaven now, My, or hell, whatever. Um, <laughs> speaks in a rather stentorian tone, and uh, it is a little provocative, but we, uh, we should not be provoked, and the Shakers not only lived communally, they invented more, they, 
Really, they they uh, invented more things than they they made very simple furniture. They made very simple. Uh, they cultivated seeds. <laughs> they they and sold them, of course. Uh, they uh, made more uh, inventions uh, of uh, rather simple machinery. Of uh, that, you know, they were a great contributor. Also, they uh, uh, they took in the world's children. And raised them, and uh, they they were good parents, even though they were celibate. <laughs> yes. What a fucking yes. idea! <laughs> the Shaker communities died out. So let's see if this not not produce. Uh, but they, But we'll, uh, let's see, we do, I have, uh, I have two minutes left. Uh, we do have the threat of war. We have the threat of war between Israel and Iran. Uh, Israel has maybe 400 nuclear weapons, and uh, they want to bomb uh, the Iranians uh, for the possibility of, of uh, their gaining one. Okay. Uh, but uh, they, since they are a very small uh, land area community, uh, country, uh, they, if uh, a hostile power uh, should uh, bomb them with an atomic bomb, uh, they uh, would be uh, decimated, and uh, they have a very high concentration, whereas uh, Iran, while it has cities, and, and the cities are threatened, uh, they, they might survive a few bombs. Uh, so therefore, the the Israelis feel that they are are justified in uh, in threatening Iran with uh, atomic warfare, and since the Iranians are threatened with atomic warfare, you have the Straits of Harbon, uh, which are the oil the gate to. Uh, Oil What's that have to um, do with simplicity? Yeah. Were being closed, and that's one significant reason that we uh, have very high petroleum oh, prices. Oh, okay. Sad. I knew we'd get there. What are we going to do about it? Thank you. You got an army. Go ahead. Use our army, man. Good evening. Uh, I'm Harold Taggart. And the simplicity revolution is simple. It's a return to feudalism. Okay. We're going to break down into a few extremely wealthy nobles and then a whole bunch of peasants. We're going to get rid of the unions. They created this middle class that's consuming all the resources. And they're out there with all their spare time um, consuming more resources. So once we, we get rid of unions, we can get back to a 16-hour work day, seven days a week. And people won't be doing all these things they're doing. Now they'll, uh, and they'll die young. We won't even have to have Social Security anymore. <laughs> also, and Jeff, you were right. <laughs> The crisis is planned. The crisis we have is planned. And uh, what they want to do is, um, is um, well, like I say, create the crisis, get rid of the middle class so the, uh, the consumption of the resources isn't what it is now. 
and there'll be enough uh, resources for everybody, uh, the few remaining. There are also uh, the proles, let's call, let's call them proles rather than peasants, so we know those are proles from proletarians. Uh, the proles won't be allowed to breed, except a few replacement uh, uh, people. This is something, Ayn Rand, that's why we're hearing so much about Ayn Rand recently, and Darwin's uh, cousin, a guy named Galton, also had the idea that only the intelligent people should be breeding. Uh, the United States had this idea. Back in uh, 1890, 1920, yeah. the United States sterilized 70,000 people. And they have also the Mississippi appendectomy, so they may be familiar with that. If a black woman went in with an, uh, for an operation, they gave her a hysterectomy. They called her an appendectomy. So we've been practicing uh, birth control for quite a while. So we can quickly reduce the amount of people on earth and have mainly the, the brighter people. Francis Galton Darwin's um, cousin that I mentioned said to me, some people are just naturally smarter. And it seems like certain families are producing the smarter people. Obviously he's talking about Darwin and himself. And of course Ayn Rand has promoted this for a long time. Anybody's read Ayn Rand, you know, uh, Dagny Taggart is one of her heroes, my last name is Taggart, so obviously I'm going to be one of the nobles. <laughs> and so anyway, as uh, uh, the crises we're in right now are deliberate. Trillion dollars. When Ronald Reagan took office, the national debt was less than a trillion. When he left office, he had quadrupled the debt. And he ran, remember what one of his platforms uh, <laughs> was? Fiscal responsibility. So, uh, one thing about Republicans, and I, I know there's not here, uh, you can always know, I, see, I'm right, let's hit him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the opposite of where we stand is the opposite of what they're saying. <laughs> but anyway, uh, a trillion dollars. If, uh, if on the day Jesus was born, God had started a trust fund for him, and every day he put a trillion dollars in that trust fund. Not, I'm sorry, not a trillion, a million. A million dollars in that trust fund every day. And he did that up to the current time. That still will not be a trillion dollars. So you can imagine, how are we going to pay off this debt? They tell us it's 16 trillion. More likely it's double that. The Federal Reserve is loaning, loaning money like crazy to try to keep the economy from sinking uh, back in uh, Bush's last year in office. So anyway, one thing crash is pollution. Air pollution is good. Once uh, the air is unbreathable, the rich people will get oxygen masks and everybody else will just die. I mean, Milton Friedman always said, have four or five plans lying around and if a crisis comes along, trot it out. There's opportunity in crisis, Friedman always said. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And uh, so they've been creating oh. as many crises as they could. Um, <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much for listening. All right. Yeah. Ah, who is John Galt? You guys are all guys chicken. Little. All right, Margaret, yeah, I just like to make note of the fact that even though I think that that some people have not been taking their medications this week. <laughs> 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 remarkably restrained and haven't yeah. resorted to physical damage. Use yeah, the mic. So, Use the mic. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Just pull it down to you a little bit. Uh, you want to hear what I said? Okay. Um, I think it can only be better. <laughs> I'm sorry? Oh, you're, 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 oh, you guys got to pay five dollars each to be in here, man. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
At any rate, um, uh, there was a magazine at work, and it was a 500-page a, a magazine called Simple Living. So when you have to produce a 500-page magazine every month to tell you how to live simply, or maybe it's called Living Simply, you know, there's something wrong with this picture. We, um, this, the economy of this country is founded on consumerism, and consumerism is really um, take, uh, is creating a want and then making the want a need so that every three years we used to need to buy a new car and um, we need to have the latest in fashion and we need to stay up with the Joneses and we need to buy a house in the suburbs and with a white picket fence and the whole thing. That doesn't work out very well but essentially uh, because uh, now because of the economy but we still have this concept of, of uh, consuming. And it's, it's really a confusion of, of quantity with quality, where we get confused and think if we have a lot of stuff, we'll be happy. If we have the newest uh, razor or whatever, uh, we'll um, get our ideal uh, life partner, uh, or, or at least laid. And um, it's... Um, it, it's so it just, the, the consumerism really has made us eat the world. In fact, there's a sign that comes around every once in a while that says, eat the world. It's like you have the right to um, take whatever you want and use whatever you want. And that's not what's, you know, that's not a reality. So um, the simplicity business, I think, um, is something that we will all have to face. And so we have to kind of separate out our feelings for it. And some of us, like me, simplicity is sort of a nostalgia for a past that really never existed, but that life did seem to be more simple and that there wasn't, you know, when I was growing up, we didn't have a television until I was a little older. Uh, we used to get out and ride our bicycles around. And, we used to play with the neighborhood kids and you could go out in the streets and, you, and your parents didn't worry about you. In fact, they didn't even think about you until they were hollering for you to come home for dinner. Um, but, um, I, I, you know, I, I think that, that that's kind of a falsity now that that's not going to happen. Um, but I think this enforced simplicity that Jeff was talking about, um, uh, this kind of social collapse that's being pr uh, predicted by many people um, is something that is very possibly a reality depending on what happens. And that's going to enforce a kind of a simplicity that's going to be um, very, very difficult for people and fatal for many people. If you look at the way the world's population is, when we were hunter-gatherer society, the entire population of the, of the earth uh, a human population of the earth was only like a half a million people um, as hunter gatherers. And that was all that it was able to uh, sustain. Um, and then when we started getting into pastoral things and agricultural things, then the population went up because we could support more people. Um, if, we, if we don't have oil, if we don't have gas, if we don't have um, those kinds of uh, uh, coal and, and fossil fuel reserves, which it's predicted that we won't. If There will be a point, and my, Frank has said this more than once, that it will cost more fossil fuel to extract fossil fuel than the fossil fuel that you get out. And when you reach that point, that is going to stop. It doesn't matter how much you have. If it takes more than you have out to pull whatever out, you're not going to do it. So, you know, it's possible that our that our current level of population in this earth that is in fact supported by the fact that we do use fossil fuels, that we use diesel in our uh, tractors and all that kind of thing. When that point comes, thank you. We are really going to have to simplify our lives, and a lot, a lot of people are going to die. Period. Uh, yeah, back in uh, 1976, I wrote a uh, science fiction novella, they were called then, uh, about 80 pages long. Uh, it was about a uh, uh, society of the future on this, on this planet 
uh, where people lived mostly underground, um, and uh, they lived a very simplistic life as things go today, uh, in terms of they didn't have many material possessions. Uh, my main character, uh, for example, uh, would be able to I have you know, a four-wall uh, cube underground, and he'd be able to uh, say, well, uh, tuba mirum um, berlioz requiem on one wall, and he'd have a, be able to see the orchestra or the instruments uh, without being played, just be, you know, without people playing, you know, um, and uh, the music in um, uh, like uh, Seascape Hawaii on another wall. He'd be able to just call that up uh, at his, uh, just by voice command. Of course, now I think that the, uh, um, like the Larry Ellisons and the uh, Bill Gates of the world can probably do that in their house now. They probably do have that technology. So, uh, but I did write that novella in 1940, uh, 1976, and uh, it, it exists in a drawer amongst my papers. It never was published, actually. But uh, other people were writing things uh, kind of similar. The, the idea of the um, uh, underground, of people living underground on Earth, uh, of course, that uh, was originally with me, but um, uh, Isaac Asimov had come up with the idea of um, using the uh, temperature uh, gradient uh, as you go down uh, into the Earth, of course, and as you go down into any other planet similar to the Earth, a um, uh, rocky planet uh, with the molten core, uh, you have a temperature gradient which you could use to extract energy, and which people do use to extract energy uh, now um, uh, with uh, geothermal. Um, but um, his idea was that uh, this one planet uh, in the Foundation uh, series, uh, I forget the name of the planet, but it was the uh, uh, the planet that was the um, uh, the capital of Trantor. the Galactic Empire. Trantor. 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 Sure, thank you. Yeah. Um, so, um, if in the far future we use Asimov's idea in the Earth, uh, we might uh, be able to have enough energy to um, uh, sustain people uh, living underground in cubes like that, and have, you know a super internet, um, and not have to have books. Now, I myself. I am just like a dinosaur, I guess. I love to have books and records, and I can't throw anything away. And uh, I have had uh, recently uh, downsized a little bit of what I see. My, a lot of my things are in boxes, so I, mean, I used to be able to see all my books and all my records and my possessions as much as possible. <laughs> they were, if they, maybe if they were in a box, I could see the box labeled there and, <laughs> and, and be able to believe, oh yeah, oh, there's that, that's, that stuff is there and that stuff is there. So that's um, a difficulty for me. Although my credential of that I thought about this sim simplifying um, of uh, uh, lifestyle was that I wrote that novella. Um, so uh, I agree with a lot of things that have been said. Um, we, of course, um, uh, had strayed from the topic of simplifying, uh, simplifying lifestyles uh, and simplifying material, the number, number of material possessions to talk about cat catastrophe theory of what's uh, going to come to our civilization. Uh, all of which um, I subscribe to the idea that that's possible. We, all, we know uh, Joe Meyer had given us a great talk about what could happen to our electric infrastructure um, totally by something outside, not caused by us, but caused by solar uh, CME, for example. Um, but um, uh, it could be caused by us. The, the um, infrastructure of our electrical grid is, is terrible, as we know. And it needs to be um, revamped. And um, um, we need to modernize. Um, uh, and we have all these problems with uh, the, uh, the third world. Uh, India wants to, everyone in India wants to have an air conditioner now. And, uh, we're in very serious uh, trouble um, with our uh, civilization um, because of our resources, uh, overpopulation. There's an interesting um, tidbit uh, that wasn't brought up today um, about the Georgia Guidestones. Um, some people have been talking about a conspiracy theory that maybe there's a, a group or a, a bunch of elites um, that want to uh, reduce the population. It's not such a bad idea unless you're one of those that gets reduced. Uh, but uh, the Georgia Guidestones are um, a bunch of uh, granite uh, monoliths that have um, inscriptions on them that uh, imply that it would be best for us to have only 700 million, I believe, uh, people on the planet. That's possibly a good idea if we could get there by um, a peaceful means. 
So uh, these guide stones were built in Georgia, and they were supposedly built by uh, uh, someone named Rosencrantz, uh, or Christian, Christian, yeah, R.C. Christian, so they might have been Rosicrucian or something like that. about what keeps the economy going in the first place. We didn't hear about a particular, particularly vicious type of economic collapse known as a runaway inflation. <laughs> and I think we ought to have a, at least an evening de devoted to topics like this. Uh, and I think what keeps the economy going Somewhere down there, you're going to find a market. Can't really keep an economy going without a market. Not a corporate market, necessarily. But a corporate market and a free market are two different things. A corporate market is welfare for the rich. And if you think politics uh, will solve the problem, well, look at the uh, well, all the stuff the Occupy movement is saying, the 1% dominating the 99%, they never do that. The politics. And if your yeah. political system is 1% dominating 99%, what do you propose to do about that? And how can you say that that's... How can you say that that is... Uh, any kind of a solution, or going to be a solution. But there are ways of invoking the economic process, busting up the capitalist union. Talk about, you know, people talk like I'm in the union, but after the union I want to bust up is the capitalist union. We're getting a little bit of that in the Republican Convention last week kind of watered down, but uh, they're talking about all these people making it on their own. Which as far as it goes, it doesn't go anywhere far enough as far as I'm concerned, but it is the cap capitalist union getting busted up. So look, ask somebody else to give you a job, go out and create your own job. So, I guess I'll leave it at that. Uh, I'll something else in a couple of minutes. I always forget something I want to come back to. We'll Welcome leave it there for now. We'll all just create our own jobs. We'll just create our own jobs. You don't like the one I have. Uh, okay, well, sim uh, simple living. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I guess you could say I, I'm a pretty simple liver. I've been living simply for a while. Uh, getting, I mean, you know, getting rid of a car. I mean, you know, uh, ten years ago, when I decided to go car free. I knew what I was getting into. I was already, uh, you know, it was associated with critical mass and bike winner and break the gridlock and some of these groups in, in Chicago. And I read uh, Divorce Your Car by Katie Alborg. And I read. Uh, Asphalt Nation by Jane Holtz Kane, and uh, you know just one thing that uh, you know that people tell you is that you know when you when you when you go car free, you're going to need to change your expectations a little bit in your lifestyle. You're you're kind of leaving hypermobility behind, and uh, you know when I had a car, I mean, gosh, I used to think nothing about every weekend loading up my kayak and my uh, camping gear and my bike and I would have a station wagon and I would go you know anywhere in the Midwest I'd leave on a Friday night come back on a Sunday night go camping fishing you know or uh, biking hike kayaking and stuff and uh, it was kind of a high energy you know lifestyle when I got rid of my car uh, those days were basically over so you you end up staying you know a lot closer to home a lot less traveling you find simpler things to do you know I uh, you know, read more books, you know, see more movies, 
come to things like the college complexes, you know, things like that that don't involve this hyper mobility. Traveling, I think I, uh, since I got rid of my car, I rented a car once and drove to Pennsylvania for my dad's funeral. And uh, I took a, a Amtrak to New York for an economics convention. And I took a mega bus a couple times, once to Cleveland and once to uh, uh, Minneapolis for uh, also for the Henry George Economics Conventions. That we have them every year, you know, they're somewhere out in, uh, usually in the Midwest or East Coast. This year I didn't go to the one in Harrisburg. I relinquished my spot for a couple of the newer guys, so to keep expenses down. But uh, so anyway, yeah, you lose a lot of that hypermobility. Uh, Simple living, to me, I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's benefits to it. I mean, you know, if you live a little simpler, one thing that I don't, I live in an apartment, so I don't have to mow lawn. Uh, I'm really not able to mow lawn anyway, because I've got tendonitis and stuff. My mother's got a house. She pays somebody to mow a lawn, but I used to mow her lawn. But, uh, you know, a lot of people are going back to push mowers, you know, things like that. A lot of people I know in this, live in the city have smaller lots. They can get by with a push mower. So there's a, you know, a lot of these simple things that you can do to save energy, to live more sustainably. Uh, one thing I do, I mentioned a few times back ago about uh, showering with, with Dr. Brown or soap. Now this is just something I do. I don't pay for my heat or gas to heat the hot water. Uh, I don't pay for my water bill. I, mean, I could just run the water around the clock, but I, but I don't. I, you know, I just feel, uh, you know, uh, being inner, you know, responsible or sustainable is, is something that just feels good. So I, I just conserve water because of that. So. What I like about Dr. Bronner's Magic Soap is I, I fill a, I have a kind of a large uh, plexiglass bowl that I fill with uh, warm water and a few drops of Dr. Bronner's. Then I turn on the warm water, I get in the shower, I get wet, I turn the water off, take my wash rag, dip it in the bowl, so, you know, lather up, and then turn the, hot, turn the water back on and rinse off, and then turn the water off when I'm done. And I don't, don't really use a lot of water. I used to do that. I, now I've, Heard people call those navy showers. I guess that's how they take a shower on boats, you know, to save yeah. the surf water in the navy. But, but I mean, it works. You know, it works for me. You know, and I said I'm not, I don't use a lot of water, and it's pretty fast. And uh, so, and I, again, I'm not a grease monkey, so I don't have to really, you know, I don't really need a lot, a lot of soap and stuff like that. So anyway, uh, now one thing that this lady mentioned, though, I, I read that uh, our, our what was supposed to be our speaker. And I said that uh, in her little blurb on College Complex's uh, website was that she blames this current bus this, to, on, on the corp, corp, corpocracy. Corporatocracy. Corporatocracy. And well, that I think she, I think her blame is mislaid. I just finished reading uh, the Re Return to Depression Economics by uh, Paul Krugman, and more or less I kind of kind of agree with what he says. The this bust here was more or less uh, uh, the fault of the sh what he calls the shadow banking system. And that are, that are, that's these institutions that kind of lived outside the realm of regulations. Now, a lot of, a lot of people, they, they had all kinds of, you know, uh, hedge fund things going and all kinds of bizarre financial risky things. And the role that the subprime mortgages paid in triggering all this well, that was their role. They more or less triggered. They kind of caused the panic. Initially, some of the early failures caused the panic, which then kind of caused the meltdown. But it wasn't just the, wasn't those subprime mortgages themselves. It was this shadow banking system that had all these risky investments, and they were outside of the, the realm of regulators. It was more or less the, uh, the trouble. So I highly recommend reading that, that book, uh, The Return to Recession Economics, I mean, Depression Economics by Paul Krugman, yes. All right. You know, not having a speaker made me focus tonight on, and you, you guys, you know. And, <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe you should simplify the college and not have guest speakers. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I remember about uh, six months or a year ago, I gave a presentation here on 100 gadgets. <laughs> that had transformed our society, and I was trying to think how many of them I own or have used at some time or another. Are they really transformative of our lives, and do we, in fact, we really need them? But the one thing I wanted to talk about was um, 
What is their simple and perhaps, if you want, complex societies, which are comprised, I think, of networks of systems. And that's what I was trying to get at in one of my questions. If one of those systems uh, fails, uh, what happens to the complex society? And you can see this technology dependency it puts us in a very precarious situation. Now, technology makes things very effective. Certainly the United States Army is technologically heavy. It's certainly beyond anything a, a sword and a shield could be, or a rifle. Uh, however, that system could break down in the field uh, as it happens. They, they run into this, or the grid goes down, or something of that nature. So it's a very precarious thing. However, if it's operating smoothly, everything is fine. Look at transportation, the complexities of transportation here. You need a, you need a very good roadbed, you need vehicles, 5,000 or more parts, uh, uh, signaling systems, you need an ambulance system, you need a police system. It's a very complex thing, and that's why transportation can break down very easily and result in catastrophes or people being late or not getting where they want to go at all flat tires, things of that nature. Um, what happens to societies when they're confronted with ca these catastrophes? Well, I was in the Southwest and they had a group there called the Anasazi. And they were confronted with 60 or 100 years of continuous drought. And the people simply disappeared. No one knows what happened to them. In the middle of the last century, we had the situation in Oklahoma and to some extent, the Okies simply disappeared. They migrated elsewhere and things like that. In other cities, in other societies, when they have catastrophes, that's true. Jeff is entirely correct. It disintegrates, such as in France with the shortage of bread. Uh, they resorted to the blame was made of the nobility, and they began killing them. Hmm. Executing them. Uh, whether or not where I'm going to go to the survivalist mode, Jeff, I'm not certain of that. Now, uh, this, it's not so easy to say, well, I'm going to rely on nature. That's what happened to the Anasazi. Yeah, it's a very precarious situation as well. Now, there are certain advantages of just living close to the earth. Certainly, if you need to fix your cabin, it's infinitely easier. If you try to fix a modern home, you need a, an ace hardware <coughs> store uh, for parts or whatever. So, and reliance close to nature is simply as precarious as well as any Eskimo if the, if the seals don't show up. Um, you know, but uh, I, I don't know if I'm going to go resort or, you know, doomsday type situation that I'm going to say we need to, you know, buy camping equipment or something like this or learn skills, outdoor skills and things of that nature. Uh, yes, the real situation is, can we sustain this level of complexity? And, the, and as uh, I think you referenced it, Doug did, the rest of the world wants that same level of complexity. Is it a drain upon the resources? Obviously, you know. I think the important thing, though, in conclusion, it's not, it isn't so much, the important thing you have to focus on, it isn't so much what you have, the, the quantity of stuff that you have, but we have to be able, and this is why there won't be the survivalists, hopefully, is that we're able to share among ourselves the resources that we do have. And if our political structures fail to do that or address it, like I heard from the Republican Convention, <laughs> we don't seem to think that's a priority in any fashion. You know, why don't we learn how to share the time here? <laughs> the college. Okay. Anyhow, thanks a lot. It was a kind of good. Right. Hey, Bing. I don't know why. You Listening off. to you guys. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I'm uh, Li Ping Yuan. Uh, it's uh, interesting to see all the talks today, especially today, uh, got uh, lots of people. Uh, 
One thing I just uh, tricked me because uh, my background is in geology and I worked uh, uh, 10 years as a geologist in a special area, uh, it's Canadian tar sands, mm -hmm. oil sands. And uh, so with, uh, I studied geology for almost 10 years and the work in that, uh, almost 10 years, so my feeling is uh, energy or oil, uh, it won't suddenly disappear or suddenly stop. It's, uh, it will be slowly getting more and more expensive. So we, we do need a different form of alternatives in the future. But uh, right now, oil uh, slowly going up. I'm saying long term is slowly going up, but short term sometimes there's an up and down. So when people, when, when it jumps uh, high and the people worry about uh, energy and uh, when I was uh, working from 1987 to 1997, uh, the oil business was quite depressing. Uh, uh, everywhere is laying off for, and then it seems no hope for that 10 years, so I left uh, the industry. And uh, then the industry suddenly becomes uh, booming. The oil price went up, and uh, I saw that was just a short uh, bump uh, back, and, but it lasts uh, almost another 10 years. Uh, my friend in the oil industry certainly they are very, very comfortable right now. But anyway, so I think uh, in general, U.S. Uh, although it's the largest energy consumption world, but uh, we have lots of oil resources, so we are not really worried about that too much. Just looking at our government uh, with lots of other countries, they don't have any oil resources. They, the, the, they pay high tax on the oil, on the energy, and uh, the government subsidizes lots of oil energy research. We, we are not at that level. So my, my feeling is the U.S. is behind in the energy industry for future but that's okay. Uh, we have some strengths uh, because other countries they sacrifice the, their citizen to pay lots of money on oil and gasoline. So they they their research for new energy is uh, more advanced than here. And uh, we there are two industries in U.S. is very advanced. Why is the healthcare? because we pay lots of money on the health care. So health care equipment and the, the, the research is, uh, I would say it's uh, quite advanced here. And also another industry is obvious, uh, industry. It's a uh, dominant the whole world. Uh, so I don't know, we pay lots of money, tax money for those weapons also. Uh, I don't know whether it's good or bad, but uh, at least we have something uh, <laughs> advanced technology uh, for good or bad. That's uh, another question. Thank you. Very fast because right now we we are going to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought we could have like a scramble oh, thing. We have another, another minute or two. Come on, man. I got these up there. Come on. So, come on. Go ahead. Go ahead. Give him a minute. I don't know. Tim, go ahead. I just want to make a quick uh, thing, uh, comment about something I saw on the news uh, over the weekend that has to do with this thing. There's a uh, mayor in the Philippines named Aguilar who has uh, levied these rules against stores from having plastic packaging. My <laughs> And, and uh, their trips to the uh, to the dump every day. They used, this town used to have 125 truckloads going to the dump every day. Now they've re reduced that in half just by uh, making the plastic packaging, all plastic bottles, plastic packaging, all that illegal. I don't have any real closing. <laughs>
remarks tonight to say, except that I hope that the improvised speaking program worked well, and that I hope that everybody still had an enjoyable night at the college. And let's hear now from Jeff for our final words. Okay, well, it's been interesting. I'm going to address various comments made by folks um, in uh, sort of reverse order of them having been made. Uh, I guess it was the gentleman where, yeah, yeah. Um, but did you make a reference to oil suddenly stopping? Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, an issue isn't probably oil suddenly stopping. But look at it this way. People, whether they're Chinese or Americans or whatever they are, they only, only got so much money to spend, whether it's on gas or other products made with oil. <coughs> and the day that a barrel of oil costs so much that a company cannot then do all the things with it and get it delivered to the gas station or wherever, is the day that they'll figure out it's a losing proposition to continue to pump the stuff out of the ground. <coughs> That's the trouble. Now, that probably won't happen all at once all over the world. But there could be gobs of oil still under the ground, but it'll turn out to be too expensive to bring it to market. And what do you do, including the amount of oil that it takes to pull it out? That's the rub. That's likely to be the rub in the first instance. That's the single most likely way that it might be fairly fast in different places around the world within a fairly short span of time. Now, as far as Chuck's comments about the whole chain and the weakest link and all that, yeah. And on top of it, Chuck, and you may be aware of this, but there's something called just in time yeah. inventory <laughs> management. Well, hello, you know. Uh, so now, you know, the stores, they're like, they've got three day supplies or some such, yeah. depending on the particular store. As I understand, they had a trucker strike in England 10 or 12 years ago. And within a matter of weeks, the society was on was on the verge, of, you know, on the verge of being on its knees, and the government had to cave into the trucker. Okay, <laughs> so you know, uh, this is the, it's, it is very much uh, a chain which which looks like some pretty damn weak links. Okay, now, um, and as far as survivalist, Chuck, the point I would make there is that. You know, and as I look at, you know, if we're, if it's going to be a choice between living underground as per Doug's scenario, hey, I'm not as, I've got a 45 and, you know, I'll just, I'll just <laughs> cash in the chips and get home. You know, and I'm not going to, but the point is, here, if I was in Vegas, I'd have to seriously make sure I've got that thing good and damn clean. Because those poor sons of bitches, that sucker's going down. You can stick a fork in those desert cities. Yeah. All right. Eventually, they ain't going to be able to afford AC, and who knows, you know, the, 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 whether anybody's going to be feel like whether anybody's going to be able to afford to drive to take the food out there into those deserts. Yeah. Eventually, they won't. They'll, they'll, oh, no, this is not word. That's we ain't going to be able to get money from these folks. So, Strong. yeah, L.A., Vegas, Let Phoenix, Tucson, that whole sector of the country, it's going to go back to what it was 200 years ago, and eventually, much of the country is going to go back to where it was 100 or 200 years ago. That's what it looks like to me. Yeah, I got it done. Uh, so, what I, because we're here, and because this joint 100 years ago, before automobiles, was a hopping joint, there's a reasonable chance that 100 years from now, this will be a hopping joint. And so, in the course of that transition over these 100 years, I ain't going to be around 100 years anyway, so, you know, and I'm going to have the, 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 those who I care about, you know, that they'll be in a position to carry on, and they'll have the various super conveniences that this golden age of, 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 of human history managed to produce at such a horrible price with respect to down the road uh, for, the, for, the, for the human race. So yeah, whether we have a billion left or a half a billion, whatever the hell it is, by the time this process, get, process gets done. Um, and uh, as far as Margaret's comment about the economy building out, built on consumerism, well, insofar as that's true, what a girl's tragedy. What a male arrangement of incentives. And it's, well, when they, when they, when they, when they, they, over the course of these roughly, again, decades, depending on what, what, how you want to measure, when they print money or whatever they do to stimulate consumer demand. <laughs> well, well, well. 
that brutal malgovernance, what they needed to do instead was to stimulate conservation, especially of natural yeah. resources. But no instead, no instead, again I say it was the greatest party in human history without any imagining that the, that, that the party would ever run out of party fluid to do. <clears throat> so, well, all right, too bad. I, I left, I was going to make a comment about TV as much of the problem here. That was a catastrophe when they allowed TV networks to first get the airwaves in exchange for fairness and other sorts of promises. And then a few generations or so later, they reneged on the airwaves. And there's a, there's a I could say, you know, I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna use the N-word if you see what I mean, but they quit. Okay? Because they reneged. Uh, so, you know, and then Gene, it comes down to, how's about this for an analogy? A bear is up there, and while the cameras ain't pointed at him, he slips a gold coin in the pocket of the ump. Okay? And of course, the ump's calling nothing but balls. <laughs> and then it's 3-0, and oh, and what's the pitcher going to do? Okay? Yeah. And that's, that's our system. 30 seconds, a couple of websites you should look at. Uh, yeah. One is called www.ted.com, that's technology, entertainment, and design. It gives a lot of uh, quick, short snippet speeches and where I look at my uh, stuff from. That's ted.com. And, uh, all right. All right. Well, Go. thank you all for coming, and uh, especially uh, our uh, two uh, speakers, uh, Jeff Schrammack and... Tim Bolger for their impromptu yes, yes, with rebuttals and remarks. Uh, thank you all for all your contributions.